Hey, it's Dave from CG Shortcuts. Today we're answering a member question from Jason and Ignacio, who wanted to know how to transition solid objects to cloth in Cinema 4D. You can get your C4D questions answered as well by becoming a CG Shortcuts member at cgshortcuts.com or over on Patreon. Now let's hop into Cinema 4D and see what we can do. So this is the kind of effect we're aiming for. And this particular example, which was shared with us by Jason, who's one of our members, is by Super Designers Studio based in Hong Kong. And I'll leave a link down below to where you can check out more of their epic work. But the technique for creating this is really the key to a lot of cool effects in Cinema 4D. So let's see how we can go about doing something similar. So I'll start with a rectangle because we want to transition from a block of cement as well, but you could use any shape you want really. Then I've just put that inside an extrude object to give it some thickness. And because we're going to turn this into cloth, which will have a lot of detailed folds and creases, we wanna make sure we're working with a mesh that has enough subdivisions. So I then pop this inside a remesh, which I've given a polygon count of 50,000, which gives us a nicely subdivided mesh like so. So now that we've got some good geometry to start from, let's right click on here and choose current state to object to convert this into an editable mesh. And we can remove the original setup if we like. So now that we've got our starting shape, let's make a nice puffy cloth shape out of this. So with it selected, let's go to tags, simulation tags, and give it a cloth tag. And these are the settings I found work best for this kind of effect, where we've got high values for the bendiness and stretchiness, a very small thickness to help with the cloth collisions, and a target length set to 120%, meaning the cloth will be able to expand 20% larger than its current size when we simulate it, which should produce some nice folds and wrinkles in our cloth. Then under the balloon tag, I've also set the overpressure to six to inflate our mesh over the course of 100 frames to give us a puffy fabric kind of look. And if we hit Control D to bring up the project settings under simulation, these are the settings I went with for this effect and I've increased the iterations to get a more accurate sim and the damping to reduce the amount of energy in the simulation to make the cloth expansion a bit smoother and a bit more stable. And I've also increased the collision values as well to prevent the cloth from intersecting with itself. And finally, in our scene settings, I've dropped the gravity to zero. So the cloth floats rather than being pulled downward. So all of that together gives us something like this, where the whole thing puffs up fairly uniformly but we do get some nice cloth-like wrinkles. But to make this look a bit more interesting, I'd like to have this puff up in sections rather than all together like this. So we'll need a way to mask the effect to control the influence of the ballooning. So let's rewind this and grab our mesh and we'll add a vertex map to this. And this is going to allow us to choose the vertices of our object, which will or won't be affected by the ballooning. So we need to paint in a striped selection which we should be able to do pretty easily in our vertex map by enabling and using fields. I'll delete the default freeze object out of here and we'll clone some objects along here to make some seams. So I'll quickly set that up. And I've just got a rectangle with the height set to zero, which basically gives us a straight line that I've then popped in a cloner and cloned it along the length of our cement block. And we'll use these to pin the cloth down and have the area between these puffing up to give us the different segments. So let's grab the vertex map and we don't want to drag the cloner in directly because it won't treat all of the stripes as a single object. But to do that, we just need to put it inside a connect object. And we can also disable welding of the points. Then that can now go into our vertex map fields as a spline object. And it's not quite looking right yet. Let's grab that field layer and down here, let's set the spline shape to mask. And rather than masking along the Z axis, we wanna project this down on the Y axis. So we'll select that. And now we're getting our stripey selection. We can also adjust the distance here to bring those lines in closer to our rectangular guides. So we want the red vertices to puff up and the yellow vertices to be locked where they are on both the top and bottom of our object but I might get rid of the stripes along the side so we can allow that to puff up freely as well. So to mask the sides off, I'll just bring in a cube, which is slightly shorter than the height of our block. So it encompasses the sides fully. And we can use that as a field as well and subtract it from our current selection. So I'll drag that into our fields list. 
and we'll set it to subtract mode and also tell it to use the volume of the cube to do the subtracting. And now we've cut the stripes from the sides and only have them along the top and bottom of our object. So now we can grab our cloth tag and to stop the ballooning happening on the stripey selection, we can use the mix animation feature. So we'll enable with pins because we want to pin those vertices in place and we'll drag our vertex map into here and we'll see what that gives us. And that's actually giving us the opposite effect of what we want, where the stripe parts are puffing up and everything else is being pinned into place. So all we need to do is invert our vertex map. So we'll grab that and under basic, we'll hit invert. So now the yellow part should puff out and the red should be pinned into place. So let's see what we get. And I think that looks pretty good. So this is going to be the puffy cloth end state. So I'm going to convert this simulation into a static mesh. So we'll right click this and choose current state to object, which gives us a new mesh, which we might call puffy remesh. And if we rewind this and delete the cloth tags, we're left with our flat block starting state and our puffy cloth end state. So we can get rid of the other stuff. And all we need to do now is animate the transition between our two states. So with our original flat remesh, let's add a pose morph tag, which will allow us to morph from one shape to another. I'll hide the puffy remesh for now. And in our pose morph, we'll set this to points mode and delete the default pose that's automatically created for us. So we're just left with the base pose, which is our flat block shape, which we want to morph into our puffy cloth shape. So we'll grab that and drag that in as our second pose and say yes to that. And our flat mesh has now conformed to the cloth shape and we can animate between them with this strength slider over here, like so. So we need to set this to animate mode so we can work on our transition where this will puff up section by section from one side to the other. So we'll need to use a deformer in conjunction with our pose morph tag to create the transition. So let's grab a morph deformer and make it a child of our main mesh. And this will automatically inherit the data from the pose morph tag, allowing us to control the transition in here as well. But the beauty of this deformer is that we can also use fields to create a nice linear transition. So let's bring in a linear field, which we want pointed along the length of our object. So I'll switch the orientation to negative Z and tighten up the fall off to maybe 40 centimeters. And you can see how we can use this to create our animated transition. So let's start this off to the side here. And on frame zero, we'll set a keyframe with our linear field in this position. And ahead to frame 50, let's move this all the way through and set another keyframe. We could also make sure there's no easing on our keyframes by taking a look at the animation in the curve editor. And I'll just make this linear so it's a consistent speed from A to B. Okay. And now we get something like this. So all that's left to do is pile a few of these blocks on top of each other and reapply some cloth dynamics so they can react to each other as they transition and turn into cloth. So I'll set the frame range to 100 and I'll bake our animated mesh as an Alembic file. So it's all self-contained and nice and easy to work with. So now all the animation is contained in this single Alembic object. So we can probably delete all the other stuff, except maybe the linear field, which we might be able to reuse when we go to texture this later, but we'll get rid of the rest, leaving us with just this. So let's hold control and drag out a copy of this. And so they can interact with each other as they puff up, let's give them both a cloth tag. And this time we'll use these settings with no bendiness or stretchiness or expanding target length. We also don't need ballooning this time, but we will use soft body with these settings to help the cloth keep its shape as it puffs up. And we'll use a tiny bit of mix animation with follow shape enabled, which also helps the cloth keep its shape. Then we'll cache our simulation so we can take a look at it real time. and we get something like this, where they interact and bounce off each other as they inflate. 
And you could also add some turbulence or other forces to this to make things look a bit more interesting, but I think this should be fine for the tutorial. So let's take a quick look at how to texture the transition. So I've got Redshift fired up here. So let's make a new Redshift standard material, which will apply to both of our cached objects. And we want the cloth to be a nice green color, transitioning from a light gray cement color from the initial block shape. So we'll set that up within one material. Let's make this RS standard, the cement material. So that can be light gray. And I'll make a copy of this and make it green for the cloth part. And to combine this so we can transition between them, we'll use a material blender. With the light gray as the base color and the green as layer one. And the output of this needs to go into the surface. And now we need to create a mask for the transition. So we'll move this out of the way for a second and make another vertex map on either of our objects. And we can reuse our linear field as a transition between our materials as well. So we'll drag that into here as a field which matches the mesh transition. So I'll copy our new vertex map to the other object as well. And we can use that in our material with a bit of help from a vertex attribute node. This needs a vertex map. So we'll use the one we just created and we'll plug the out color into our material blender as a mask for the two layers. And if that doesn't work, we just need to check that the vertex map we're using has a unique name. But I can see it's called vertex map, but the map we created earlier, which is baked into the Alembic was also called vertex map. So we could just give it another name, or if we move our new map to the end, it'll override the other one with the same name and give us exactly what we're looking for. So with a few tweaks to the materials, you should end up with something like this. You can grab the render ready project file from this from our website at the link below. And if you found this video useful, feel free to leave a like or a comment down there as well. And if you need a bit of extra help with Cinema 4D, please do get in touch or become a CG Shortcuts member, which gives you access to all of our premium C4D training and resources so you can master Cinema 4D faster. Just head over to cgshortcuts.com so that's it for now, I'll catch you next time.